Chapters 8 and 9 of The Red Battle Flyer by Captain Manfred Freiherr von Richthofen. Translated by T. L. S. Barker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 8 My First English Victim. 17th September, 1915. We were all at the butts trying our machine guns. On the previous day we had received our new aeroplanes, and the next morning Volka was to fly with us. We were all beginners. None of us had a success so far. Consequently everything that Volka told us was to us gospel truth. Every day during the last few days he had, as he said, shot one or two Englishmen for breakfast. The next morning, the 17th of September, was a gloriously fine day. It was therefore only to be expected that the English would be very active. Before we started, Volka repeated to us his instructions, and for the first time we flew as a squadron commanded by the great man whom we followed blindly. We had just arrived at the front when we recognized a hostile flying squadron that was proceeding in the direction of Cambrai. Volka was, of course, the first to see it, for he saw a great deal more than ordinary mortals. Soon we understood the position, and every one of us strove to follow Bolka closely. It was clear to all of us that we should pass our first examination under the eyes of our beloved leader. Slowly we approached the hostile squadron. It could not escape us. We had intercepted it, for we were between the front and our opponents. If they wished to go back, they had to pass us. We counted the hostile machines. They were seven in number. We were only five. All the Englishmen flew large, bomb-carrying two-seaters. In a few seconds the dance would begin. Volka had come very near the first English machine, but he did not yet shoot. I followed. Close to me were my comrades. The Englishman nearest to me was traveling in a large boat painted with dark colors. I did not reflect very long, but took my aim and shot. He also fired, and so did I and both of us missed our aim. A struggle began, and the great point for me was to get to the rear of the fellow because I could only shoot forward with my gun. He was differently placed for his machine gun was movable. It could fire in all directions. Apparently he was no beginner, for he knew exactly that his last hour had arrived at the moment when I got at the back of him. At that time I had not yet the conviction he must fall, which I have now on such occasions but on the contrary I was curious to see whether he would fall. There is a great difference between the two feelings. When one is shot down one's first, second, or third opponent, then one begins to find out how the trick is done. My Englishman twisted and turned, going crisscross. I did not think for a moment that the hostile squadron contained other Englishmen who might conceivably come to the aid of their comrade. I was animated by a single thought. The man in front of me must come down, whatever happens. At last a favorable moment arrived. My opponent had apparently lost sight of me. Instead of twisting and turning, he flew straight along. In a fraction of a second I was at his back with my excellent machine. I gave him a short series of shots with my machine gun. I had gone so close that I was afraid I might dash into the Englishman. Suddenly I nearly yelled with joy, for the propeller of the enemy machine had stopped turning. I had shot his engine to pieces. The enemy was compelled to land, for it was impossible for him to reach his own lines. The English machine was curiously swinging to and fro. Probably something had happened to the pilot. The observer was no longer visible. His machine gun was apparently deserted. Obviously I had hit the observer, and he had fallen from his seat. The Englishman landed close to the flying ground of one of our squadrons. I was so excited that I landed also, and my eagerness was so great that I nearly smashed up my machine. The English flying machine and my own stood close together. I rushed to the English machine and saw that a lot of soldiers were running towards my enemy. When I arrived, I discovered that my assumption had been correct. I had shot the engine to pieces and both the pilot and observer were severely wounded. The observer died at once, and the pilot while being transported to the nearest dressing station. I honored the fallen enemy by placing a stone on his beautiful grave. 
When I came home, Bolka and my other comrades were already at breakfast. They were surprised that I had not turned up. I reported proudly that I had shot down an Englishman. All were full of joy, for I was not the only victor. As usual, Bolka had shot down an opponent for breakfast, and every one of the other men also had downed an enemy for the first time. I would mention that, since that time, no English squadron ventured as far as Cabray as long as Bolka's squadron was there. The Battle of the Somme During my whole life I have not found a happier hunting ground than in the course of the Somme battle. In the morning, as soon as I had got up, the first Englishman arrived, and the last did not disappear until long after sunset. Bolka once said that this was the El Dorado of the flying men. There was a time when, within two months, Bolka's bag of machines increased from twenty to forty. We beginners had not at that time the experience of our master, and we were quite satisfied when we did not get a hiding. It was an exciting period. Every time we went up, we had a fight. Frequently we fought really big battles in the air. There were sometimes from forty to sixty English machines, but unfortunately the Germans were often in the minority. With them, quality was more important than quantity. Still, the Englishman is a smart fellow. That we must allow. Sometimes the English came down to a very low altitude and visited Volka in his quarters upon which they threw their bombs. They absolutely challenged us to battle and never refused fighting. We had a delightful time with our chasing squadron. The spirit of our leader animated all his pupils. We trusted him blindly. There was no possibility that one of us would be left behind. Such a thought was incomprehensible to us. Animated by that spirit, we gaily diminished the number of our enemies. On the day when Bolka fell, the squadron had brought down forty opponents. By now the number has been increased by more than a hundred. Bolka's spirit lives still among his capable successors. Bolka's Death, 28 October 1916. One day we were flying, once more guided by Bolka, against the enemy. We always had a wonderful feeling of security when he was with us. After all, he was the one and only. The weather was very gusty and there were many clouds. There were no aeroplanes about except fighting ones. From a long distance we saw two impertinent Englishmen in the air who actually seemed to enjoy the terrible weather. We were six, and they were two. If they had been twenty, and if Bolka had given us the signal to attack, we should not have been at all surprised. The struggle began in the usual way. Bolka tackled the one, and I the other. I had to let go, because one of the German machines got in my way. I looked around and noticed Bolka settling his victim about two hundred yards away from me. It was the usual thing. Bolka would shoot down his enemy, and I had to look on. Close to Bolka flew a good friend of his. It was an interesting struggle. Both men were shooting. It was probable that the Englishman would fall at any moment. Suddenly I noticed an unnatural movement of the two German flying machines. Immediately I thought, collision. I had not yet seen a collision in the air. I had imagined that it would look quite different. In reality, what happened was not a collision. The two machines merely touched one another. However, if two machines go at the tremendous pace of flying machines, the slightest contact has the effect of a violent concussion. Bolka drew away from his victim and descended in large curves. He did not seem to be falling, but when I saw him descending below me I noticed that part of his planes had broken off. I could not see what happened afterwards, but in the clouds he lost an entire plane. Now his machine was no longer steerable. It fell accompanied all the time by Bolka's faithful friend. When we reached home we found the report, Bolka is dead, had already arrived. We could scarcely realize it. The greatest pain was, of course, felt by the man who had the misfortune to be involved in the accident. It is a strange thing that everybody who met Bolka imagined that he alone was his true friend. I have made the acquaintance of about forty men each of whom imagined that he alone was Bolka's intimate. Each imagined that he had the monopoly of Bolka's affections. Men whose names were unknown to Bolka believed that he was particularly fond of them. 
This is a curious phenomenon which I have never noticed in anyone else. Volka had not a personal enemy. He was equally polite to everybody, making no differences. The only one who was perhaps more intimate with him than the others was the very man who had the misfortune to be in the accident which caused his death. Nothing happens without God's will. That is the only consolation which any of us can put to our souls during this war. My Eighth Victim In Volka's time eight was quite a respectable number. Those who hear nowadays of the colossal bags made by certain aviators must feel convinced that it has become easier to shoot down a machine. I can assure those who hold that opinion that the flying business is becoming more difficult from month to month and even from week to week. Of course, with the increasing number of aeroplanes, one gains increased opportunities for shooting down one's enemies, but at the same time, the possibility of being shot down oneself increases. The armament of our enemies is steadily improving, and their number is increasing. When Immelman shot down his first victim, he had the good fortune to find an opponent who carried not even a machine gun. Such little innocence one finds nowadays only at the training ground for beginners. On the ninth of November, 1916, I flew towards the enemy with my little comrade Immelman, who then was eighteen years old. We were both in Volka's squadron of chasing aeroplanes. We had previously met one another and had got on very well. Comradeship is a most important thing. We went to work. I had already bagged seven enemies and Immelman five. At that time this was quite a lot. Soon after our arrival at the front we saw a squadron of bombing aeroplanes. They were coming along with impertinent assurance. They arrived in enormous numbers as was usual during the Somme battle. I think there were about forty or fifty machines approaching. I cannot give the exact answer. They had selected an object for their bombs not far from our aerodrome. I reached them when they had almost attained their objective. I approached the last machine. My first few shots incapacitated the hostile machine gunner. Possibly they had tickled the pilot, too. At any rate, he resolved to land with his bombs. I fired a few more shots to accelerate his progress downwards. He fell close to our flying ground at Leginocourt. While I was fighting my opponent, Immelman had tackled another Englishman and had brought him down in the same locality. Both of us flew quickly home in order to have a look at the machines we had downed. We jumped into a motor car, drove in the direction where our victims lay, and had to run along a distance through the fields. It was very hot, therefore I unbuttoned all my garments, even the collar and the shirt. I took off my jacket, left my cap in the car, but took with me a big stick. My boots were miry up to the knees. I looked like a tramp. I arrived in the vicinity of my victim. In the meantime, a lot of people had, of course, gathered around. At one spot there was a group of officers. I approached them, greeted them, and asked the first one whom I met, whether he could tell me anything about the aspect of the aerial battle. It is always interesting to find out how a fight in the air looks to the people down below. I was told that the English machine had thrown bombs and that the aeroplane that had come down was still carrying its bombs. The officer who gave me this information took my arm, went with me to the other officers, asked my name, and introduced me to them. I did not like it, for my attire was rather disarranged. On the other hand, all the officers looked as spick and span as on parade. I was introduced to a personage who impressed me rather strangely. I noticed a general's trousers, an order at the neck, an unusually youthful face, and undefiable epaulets. In short, the personage seemed extraordinary to me. During our conversation I buttoned my trousers and collar and adopted a somewhat military attitude. I had no idea who the officer was. I took my leave and went home again. In the evening the telephone rang, and I was told that the undefinable somebody with whom I had been talking had been His Royal Highness, the Grand Duke of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha. I was ordered to go to him. It was known that the English had intended to throw bombs on his headquarters. Apparently, I had helped to keep the aggressors away from him. Therefore, I was given the Saxe-Coburg-Gotha medal for bravery. 
I always enjoy this adventure when I look at the medal. Major Hawker I was extremely proud when, one fine day, I was informed that the airman whom I had brought down on the 23rd of November, 1916, was the English Immelman. In view of the character of our fight, it was clear to me that I had been tackling a flying champion. One day I was blithely flying to give chase when I noticed three Englishmen who also had apparently gone hunting. I noticed that they were ogling me, and as I felt much inclination to have a fight, I did not want to disappoint them. I was flying at a lower altitude. Consequently, I had to wait until one of my English friends tried to drop on me. After a short while on, the three came sailing along and attempted to tackle me in the rear. After firing five shots he had to stop, for I had swerved in a sharp curve. The Englishman tried to catch me up in the rear while I tried to get behind him. So we circled round and round like madmen after one another at an altitude of about ten thousand feet. First we circled twenty times to the left, and then thirty times to the right, each tried to get behind and above the other. Soon I discovered I was not meeting a beginner. He had not the slightest intention of breaking off the fight. He was traveling in a machine which turned beautifully. However, my own was better at rising than his, and I succeeded at last in getting above and beyond my English waltzing partner. When we had got down to about 6,000 feet without having achieved anything in particular, my opponent ought to have discovered that it was time for him to take his leave. The wind was favorable to me, for it drove us more and more towards the German position. At last we were above Bonpon, about half a mile behind the German front. The impertinent fellow was full of cheek, and when we had got down to about 3,000 feet, he merrily waved to me, as if he would say, "'Well, how do you do?' The circles which we made around one another were so narrow that their diameter was probably no more than 250 or 300 feet. I had time to take a good look at my opponent. I looked down into his carriage and could see every movement of his head. If he had not had his cap on, I would have noticed what kind of a face he was making. My Englishman was a good sportsman, but by and by the thing became a little too hot for him. He had to decide whether he would land on German ground or whether he would fly back to the English lines. Of course, he tried the latter, after having endeavored in vain to escape me by loopings and such like tricks. At that time his first bullets were flying around me, for hitherto neither of us had been able to do any shooting. When he had come down to about three hundred feet, he tried to escape by flying in a zigzag course, during which, as is well known, it is difficult for an observer to shoot. That was my most favorable moment. I followed him at an altitude of from 250 feet to 150 feet, firing all the time. The Englishman could not help falling, but the jamming of my gun nearly robbed me of my success. My opponent fell, shot through the head, 150 feet behind our line. His machine gun was dug out of the ground, and it ornaments the entrance of my dwelling. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 I get the André pour les Maurice. I had brought down my sixteenth victim, and I had come to the head of the list of all the flying chasers. I had obtained the aim which I had set myself. In the previous year my friend Linker, with whom I was training, had asked me, What is your object? What will you obtain by flying? I replied jokingly, I would like to be the first of the chasers. That must be very fine. That I should succeed in this I did not believe myself. Other people also did not expect my success. Bokel is supposed to have said, not to me personally, I have only heard the report when asked which of the fellows is likely to become a good chaser. That is the man pointing his finger in my direction. Bolka and Immelman were given the André pour les Maurits when they had brought down their eighth aeroplane. I had downed twice that number. The question was, what would happen to me? I was very curious. It was rumored that I was to be given command of a chasing squadron. One day a telegram arrived which stated, Lieutenant von Richthofen is appointed commander of the 11th Chasing Squadron. I must say I was annoyed. I had learnt to work so well with my comrades of Bulka's squadron, and now I had to begin all over again, working hand in hand with different people. It was a beastly nuisance. Besides, I should have preferred the entrepôt les Maurits. 
Two days later, when we were sitting sociably together, we men of Volka's squadron, celebrating my departure, a telegram from headquarters arrived. It stated that His Majesty had graciously condescended to give me the André Pour Le Marite. Of course, my joy was tremendous. I had never imagined that it would be so delightful to command a chasing squadron. Even in my dreams I had not imagined that there would ever be a Richthofen squadron of aeroplanes. Les Petits Rogers It occurred to me to have my packing case painted all over in staring red. The result was that everyone got to know my red bird. My opponents also seemed to have heard of the colored transformation. During a fight on quite a different section of the front, I had the good fortune to shoot into a vicar's two-seater, which peacefully photographed the German artillery position. My friend the photographer had not the time to defend himself. He had to make haste to get down upon firm ground, for his machine began to give suspicious indications of fire. When we airmen notice that phenomenon in an enemy plane, we say, he stinks. As it turned out, it was really so. When the machine was coming to earth, it burst into flames. I felt some human pity for my opponent and had resolved not to cause him to fall down, but merely to compel him to land. I did so particularly because I had the impression that my opponent was wounded, for he did not fire a single shot. When I had got down to an altitude of about 1,500 feet, engine trouble compelled me to land without making any curves. The result was very comical. My enemy with his burning machine landed smoothly, while I, his victor, came down next to him in the barbed wire of our trenches, and my machine overturned. The two Englishmen, who were not a little surprised at my collapse, greeted me like sportsmen. As mentioned before, they had not fired a shot, and they could not understand why I had landed so clumsily. They were the first two Englishmen whom I had brought down alive. Consequently, it gave me particular pleasure to talk to them. I asked them whether they had previously seen my machine in the air, and one of them replied, Oh, yes, I know your machine very well. We call it Le Petit Rouget. English and French Flying, February 1917 I was trying to compete with Bolka's squadron. Every evening we compared our bags. However, Bolka's pupils are smart rascals. I cannot get ahead of them. The utmost one can do is to draw level with them. The Bolka section has an advantage over my squadron of 100 aeroplanes downed. I must allow them to retain it. Everything depends on whether we have for opponents those French tricksters or those daring rascals the English. I prefer the English. Frequently their daring can only be described as stupidity. In their eyes it may be pluck and daring. The great thing in air fighting is that the decisive factor does not lie in trick flying, but solely in the personal ability and energy of the aviator. A flying man may be able to loop and do all the stunts imaginable, and yet he may not succeed in shooting down a single enemy. In my opinion, the aggressive spirit is everything and that spirit is very strong in us Germans. Hence we shall always retain the domination of the air. The French have a different character. They like to put traps and to attack their opponents unawares. That cannot easily be done in the air. Only a beginner can be caught, and one cannot set traps because an aeroplane cannot hide itself. The invisible aeroplane has not yet been discovered. Sometimes, however, the Gaelic blood asserts itself. The Frenchman will then attack. But the French attacking spirit is like bottled lemonade. It lacks tenacity. The Englishmen, on the other hand, one notices that they are of Germanic blood. Sportsmen easily take to flying, and Englishmen see in flying nothing but a sport. They take a perfect delight in looping the loop, flying on their back, and indulging in other stunts for the benefit of our soldiers in the trenches. All these tricks may impress people who attend a sports meeting, but the public at the battlefield is not as appreciative of these things. It demands higher qualifications than trick flying. Therefore, the blood of English pilots will have to flow in streams. I am shot down, middle of March, 1917. I have had an experience which might perhaps be described as being shot down. At the same time, I call shot down only when one falls down. 
Today I got into trouble, but I escaped with a whole skin. I was flying with the squadron and noticed an opponent who was also flying in a squadron. It happened above the German artillery position in the neighborhood of Lenz. I had to fly quite a distance to get there. It tickles one's nerves to fly towards the enemy, especially when one can see him from a long distance and when several minutes must elapse before one can start fighting. I imagine that at such a moment my face turns a little pale, but unfortunately I have never had a mirror with me. I like that feeling for it is a wonderful nerve stimulant. One observes the enemy from afar. One has recognized that his squadron is really an enemy formation. One counts the number of the hostile machines and considers whether the conditions are favorable or unfavorable. A factor of enormous importance is whether the wind forces me away from or towards our front. For instance, I once shot down an Englishman. I fired the fatal shot above the English position. However, the wind was so strong that his machine came down close to the German captive balloons. We Germans had five machines. Our opponents were three times as numerous. The English flew about like midges. It is not easy to disperse a swarm of machines which fly together in good order. It is impossible for a single machine to do it. It is extremely difficult for several aeroplanes, particularly if the difference in number is as great as it was in this case. However, one feels such a superiority over the enemy that one does not doubt of success for a moment. The aggressive spirit, the offensive, is the chief thing everywhere in war, and the air is no exception. However, the enemy had the same idea. I noticed that at once. As soon as they observed us, they turned round and attacked us. Now we five had to look sharp. If one of them should fall, there might be a lot of trouble for all of us. We went close together and allowed the foreign gentlemen to approach us. I watched whether one of the fellows would hurriedly take leave of his colleagues. There, one of them is stupid enough to depart alone. I can reach him and I say to myself, That man is lost. Shouting aloud, I am after him. I have come up to him, or at least am getting very near to him. He starts shooting prematurely, which shows that he is nervous. So I say to myself, Go on shooting. You won't hit me. He shot with a kind of ammunition which ignites, so I could see his shots passing me. I felt as if I were sitting in front of a gigantic watering pot. The sensation was not pleasant. Still, the English usually shoot with their beastly snuff, and so we must try and get accustomed to it. One can get accustomed to anything. At the moment, I think, I laughed aloud. But soon I got a lesson. When I had approached the Englishman quite closely, when I had come to a distance of about three hundred feet, I got ready for firing, aimed, and gave a few trial shots. The machine guns were in order. The decision would be there before long. In my mind's eye, I saw my enemy dropping. My former excitement was gone. In such a position, one thinks quite calmly and collectedly and weighs the probabilities of hitting and of being hit. Altogether, the fight itself is the least exciting part of the business as a rule. He who gets excited in fighting is sure to make mistakes. He will never get his enemy down. Besides, calmness is, after all, a matter of habit. At any rate, in this case, I did not make a mistake. I approached my man up to fifty yards. Then I fired some well-aimed shots and thought that I was bound to be successful. That was my idea. But suddenly I heard a tremendous bang when I had scarcely fired ten cartridges. Presently, again, something hit my machine. It became clear to me that I had been hit, or rather my machine. At the same time, I noticed a fearful benzene stench, and I observed that the motor was running slack. The Englishman noticed it too, for he started shooting with redoubled energy while I had to stop it. I went right down. Instinctively, I switched off the engine, and indeed it was high time to do this. When a pilot's benzene tank has been perforated, and when the infernal liquid is squirting around his legs, the danger of fire is very great. In front is an explosive engine of more than 150 horsepower, which is red hot. If a single drop of benzene should fall on it, the whole machine would be in flames. I left in the air a thin white cloud. I knew its meaning from my enemies. Its appearance is the first sign of a coming explosion. I was at an altitude of 9,000 feet and had to travel a long distance to get down. By the kindness of Providence, my engine stopped running. 
I have no idea with what rapidity I went downward. At any rate, the speed was so great that I could not put my head out of the machine without being pressed back by the rush of air. Soon I lost sight of my enemy. I had only time to see what my four comrades were doing while I was dropping to the ground. They were still fighting. Their machine guns and those of their opponents could be heard. Suddenly I noticed the rocket. Is it a signal of the enemy? No, it cannot be. The light is too great for a rocket. Evidently a machine is on fire. What machine? The burning machine looks exactly as if it were one of our own. No, praise the Lord, it is one of the enemies. Who can have shot him down? Immediately afterwards a second machine drops out and falls perpendicularly to the ground, turning, turning, turning exactly as I did, but suddenly it recovers its balance. It flies straight towards me. It also is an albatross. No doubt it had the same experience as I had. I had fallen to an altitude of perhaps one thousand feet and had to look out for a landing. Now such a sudden landing usually leads to breakages, and as these are occasionally serious, it was time to look out. I found a meadow. It was not very large, but it just sufficed if I used due caution. Besides, it was favorably situated on the high road near Hennen Littard. There I meant to land. Everything went as desired, and my first thought was, what has become of the other fellow? He landed a few kilometers from the spot where I had come to the ground. I had ample time to inspect the damage. My machine had been hit a number of times. The shot which caused me to give up the fight had gone through both benzene tanks. I had not a drop of benzene left, and the engine itself had also been damaged by shots. It was a pity, for it had worked so well. I let my legs dangle out of the machine and probably made a very silly face. In a moment I was surrounded by a large crowd of soldiers. Then came an officer. He was quite out of breath. He was terribly excited. No doubt something fearful had happened to him. He rushed towards me, gasped for air, and asked, I hope that nothing has happened to you. I have followed the whole affair and am terribly excited. Good Lord, it looked awful. I assured him that I felt quite well, jumped down from the side of my machine, and introduced myself to him. Of course, he did not understand a particle of my name. However, he invited me to go in his motor car to Hennen Littard, where he was quartered. He was an engineer officer. We were sitting in the motor and were commencing our ride. My host was still extraordinarily excited. Suddenly he jumped up and asked, Good Lord, but where is your chauffeur? At first I did not quite understand what he meant. Probably I looked puzzled. Then it dawned upon me that he thought I was the observer of a two-seater, and that he asked after the fate of my pilot. I pulled myself together and said in the driest tones, I always drive myself. Of course the word drive is absolutely taboo among the flying men. A aviator does not drive, he flies. In the eyes of the kind gentleman I had obviously lost caste when he discovered that I drove my own aeroplane. The conversation began to slacken. We arrived in his quarters. I was still dressed in my dirty and oily leather jacket and had round my neck a thick wrap. On our journey he had, of course, asked me a tremendous number of questions. Altogether he was far more excited than I was. When we got to his diggings he forced me to lie down on the sofa, or at least he tried to force me because, he argued, I was bound to be terribly done up through my fight. I assured him that this was not my first aerial battle but he did not apparently give me much credence. Probably I did not look very martial. After we had been talking for some time, he asked me, of course, the celebrated question, Have you ever brought down a machine? As I said before, he had probably not understood my name. So I answered nonchalantly, Oh, yes, I have done so now and then. He replied, Indeed, perhaps you have shot down two. I answered, No, not two, but twenty-four. He smiled, repeated his question, and gave me to understand that, when he was speaking about shooting down an aeroplane, he meant not shooting at an aeroplane, but shooting into an aeroplane in such a manner that it would fall to the ground and remain there. I immediately assured him that I entirely shared his conception of the meaning of the words shooting down. Now I had completely lost caste with him. He was convinced that I was a fearful liar. He left me sitting where I was, 
and told me that a meal would be served in an hour. If I liked, I could join in. I accepted his invitation and slept soundly for an hour. Then we went to the officers' club. Arrived at the club, I was glad to find that I was wearing the André pour les Maurice. Unfortunately, I had no uniform jacket underneath my greasy leather, but only a waistcoat. I apologized for being so badly dressed. Suddenly my good chief discovered on me the André pour les Maurice. He was speechless with surprise, and assured me that he did not know my name. I gave him my name once more. Now it seemed to dawn upon him that he had heard my name before. He feasted me with oysters and champagne, and I did gloriously until at last my orderly arrived and fetched me with my car. I learned from him that Comrade Lupert had once more justified his nickname. He was generally called the Bullet Catcher, for his machine suffered badly in every fight. Once it was hit sixty-four times, yet he had not been wounded. This time he had received a glancing shot on the chest, and he was by this time in hospital. I flew his machine to port. Unfortunately, this excellent officer, who promised to become another Bolka, died a few weeks later, a hero's death for the fatherland. In the evening I could assure my kind host of Lenin Littard that I had increased my bag to twenty-five. End of chapter 9. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com.